as capitalism finds itself in crisis around the world, some entrepreneurs are reinventing how business is done. In its cover story this week, Fenwick looks at a new generation of social entrepreneurs who are changing the lives for the better while making money. Joining us in studio, we have Justin van der Waalt, owner and founder of Just PCs. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Justin, of course. Let's Let's look at how the world has changed and what's happened to open up a space for social entrepreneurs. Hi, the, yeah, um, it's, it's uh, how, how I found it is that um, th there's, there's more, in, in my industry, there's more and more corporate companies uh, that want to um, invest into their corporate social responsibility and investment. And um, we've taken, taken that and um, applied it to take back the redundant IT equipment that we then refurbish and um, donate to um, uh, non-profit organizations and, and to schools and also uh, to, to assist them to sell it back to their staff at a, at a minimal rate in order to um, uh, get their staff uh, technology that they wouldn't have been able to afford um, previously. But, but Justin, before I, I come to you, Mark, just want to get an understanding of your journey to actually get to that point. I mean, lots of social entrepreneurs will always talk about the gap that or the disconnect they have with the uh, funding structures to actually get their ideas off the ground. Was your journey similar to those or did you have to approach uh, the, the funding aspect of your journey in a completely different way? My, my company started um, about uh, plus minus 10 years ago out of my flat um, uh, living room um, uh, with no funds and uh, also not, not, lot, not a lot of knowledge on how to run a business or how to be an entrepreneur. Um, but over the years I, I've, I've, uh, I've taught myself and also um, uh, attended a lot of uh, self-help courses that assisted me to, um, to become a successful entrepreneur, well, uh, on the way to being a successful entrepreneur at least. And um, I've, I've, I've grown the business without any funding. Um, two years ago, we, we got an overdraft on a bank account, if you can call that funding. Right. But um, <laughs> without any funding to, to where we are now, and uh, we operate uh, a 1,500 square meter factory and um, two retail outlets in the Western Cape, and uh, looking at um, coming into Gauteng. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I think maybe what we can do, if you take one step back mm. and you look at how we structured the story from, mm. uh, from an editorial perspective, I think Justin's story is fantastic because you've got this nice entrepreneur story, you've got somebody who spotted a gap and they've been able to do something that it, it, it's, it's, co it's often common sense, but it's been able to identify a gap and not just do it from a profit motive, I'm sure profit is part of the motive, but the motive is to, do, to fill a gap and be able to have a business that gives back into to uh, fill a need in society. So uh, I think when we looked at the story, and, and I, I get very frustrated with this whole so social entrepreneurship right. concept because I think a lot of people sit there and and, and there's is it CSI, is it sustainable triple bottom line reporting? Yeah, there's there's plenty of. Um, there's plenty of jargon around this whole concept of social entrepreneurship. The point is, what is the is it a charity case now? And I think the point gets made by one of the entrepreneurs in the story, mm. where they actually talk about, you know, if 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 it's a charity initiative, money simply gets put into the system and it gets consumed, and we start again. We go and we hit up the same people for money, we hit up the same people for resources, and we end up saying, but we're not actually making a return on it. What I think is good about this, and, and we look at a couple of different entrepreneurs in this perspective, is we look at them from the from the idea of what are they doing, how are they making a business that's actually sustainable, it's self-supporting, it, it's, mm. it's, it's not just a case of let's throw some money at a problem because and hope Because those that charities aren't sustainable. Correct, and, and I think that's exactly the problem that you're seeing with a lot of these issues. A, a, and one of the things, you know, just from personal insight is, you know, a few years back I went to a, a conference organized by one of the accounting or auditing firms mm. and, and they were talking about sustainable reporting and they were all handing out awards and, uh, and without sounding totally sexist, you know, it was essentially a whole lot of 20 something blonde marketing girls and they were all celebrating a lunch about how fantastic their report was. Great. Uh, uh, f full mm -hmm. marks to them for the fact that they're doing it. But where there is an issue is going and looking at these a a at sustainability and saying it's not a case of a marketing function that sits in some department that can put together a fantastic report, which ironically actually chops down a whole lot of trees There we go back. <laughs> that the point is that we we need to build up these businesses into something that is sustainable, that, that can use capital smartly, and it's not going to just be 
it, it's not going to fall apart the moment that you actually want to to produce something. In you know, five years' time, that thing should still be there, should be employing more people and requiring less resources to keep it going. But Mark, would you would you say that we actually have the tools right now to actually measure good? Um, and, and I think that's maybe what those blonde marketing girls are trying to <laughs> do. They're trying to show some sort of result on the back of some sort of investment that's been made. How do you measure social enterprises? Do we use the same yardstick that we apply to normal um, profit-making businesses with profit at the center of the business model? Okay, so I think you're going to see an interesting thing looking at, and Premier US is a good example because there's a lot of transparency around wages and profitability, but you can probably extrapolate across Europe, etc. Over the last decade, wages, in real terms, have gone nowhere. So in other words, companies have become significantly more profitable wages have gone nowhere. Are you looking after your employees? You can all point to your little wellness programs mm. and that kind of thing. But So the business is there to make profit. Why is it there to make profit? Because they're shareholders and there are stakeholders that require returns on it. So then you say, well, okay, let's put profit to one side for the moment. And then they start pointing to this triple bottom line thing. And this is where it starts to become blurred with CSI mm. and sustainability reporting because guys say, well, yeah, it, it doesn't matter that I'm chopping down trees to write the report. I'm creating. I've got. A, I'm creating employment for these blonde girls in the marketing department too. Okay. Again, I'm being very flippant in that. Right, the, right, right. But the point is, like, how sustainable is that? What are we trying to actually achieve there? And I think that you've got to start looking at these projects. And, and for instance, there's a very cool project that it's called Food Pods inside here, mm. that, that essentially looks at this franchising of. Um, food, it's a it's a f food franchise model for fresh food within the in, within the communities. And what you're doing is you're actually helping these guys establish miniature businesses. Mm. They're feeding community, they are using, they're growing natural resources. And it's something that's tangible. You can say that this could still be happening a couple of years from now. It's not a case of the money's been thrown in, it's not, and it's going to disappear from there. So I, I think it's very difficult to make this. Yes, profit is always going to be a motive. The question is, what are these businesses mm -hmm. doing to be the making sure they're still around there? Just to jump in there, when it comes to social impact investing, I think the, the term is sort of very common now, I think there has been no formal measurement process uh, put in place just yet. It's still a relatively new area, and the whole social entrepreneurship space is still new around the world. So in terms of standards and measurability, I think those processes are still um, being formed and being decided upon everywhere. Let's look at the, the response of uh, response to uh, social enterprises in terms of the funding capacity. O other than uh, an overdraft, um, mm -hmm. who's funding? Where are, the, where are these um, high impact investors uh, and how do you find them? Okay, so I, I think I want to split this to two questions. I'll actually start off by throwing a question to Justin mm -hmm. here. You, you're a CEO or an MD of a business. Is your motive profit? In order to, to have a sustainable business, I, uh, my motive needs to be profit mm -hmm. as well, yes, definitely. Okay, so now, a, and somebody comes to you and they say, all right, I'll inject additional capital into your business. How do you, how do you view that? What do, you, do, you, do you feel threatened by the introduction of a new equity partner and, and what their motive would be going forward? Well, it, it, would, it would definitely 100% depend on what they can bring to the business mm -hmm. as well, not just mm -hmm. the money, but... Um, in, in terms of experience or um, uh, 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 being an addition to the company. Uh, so, so I think there's the point, you've got to be yeah. able to manage the stakeholders that are in, in this thing. And, and it's very interesting, you talk about the, the whole thing about social capital. There's an organization called SASEX, which was uh, the African Social Investment Exchange. And it was actually, it's, it's an incredibly unique initiative. It's essentially what you do is you list, it's a bit like a miniature stock exchange where right. you list um, social projects, and I think it's in initially it's actually held by Greater Good SA, which happens, which yeah. is then owned by by um, Katie's and a couple of other asset management firms. This thing has got full transparency of projects. There are awesome projects on there. Earlier this year, and, and basically what you do is you buy a share in a project. So if Justin's business was one of those businesses that was listed there, it's not. But you'd have the opportunity to be able to go and put money into it. If you believed in food programs in the townships, um, pick a project. You could pick it. You could have an inve make an investment, and, and it was 50 rand a share, I think, and use a credit card to go through. So there's an individual be able to crowdfund and be able to do it. Unfortunately, that's just never gained any traction in South mm. Africa. We see all of this money that goes into the social um, the the CS I type projects and very few of the, and you've got all of these fantastic projects which are full there's full reporting on them they're audited financials there's everything that you could possibly want 
and this exchange is essentially defunct now because people cannot get their projects off the ground, they cannot get capital to flow from those guys that have it to right. those guys that need it. And I think that that's the issue that the, we face in this place. And of course the guys that have it would uh, to some extent be high net worth individuals. Um, I just want to unpack that, that mm -hmm. a little bit. I mean, are we finding that these are, how big is the South African base? Let's start there. And whether we are seeing more of a participation or attraction from high net worth, in, uh, net worth individuals that are foreign based uh, coming in and extending or revisiting the concept of philanthropy uh, and and saying, mm -hmm. okay, maybe I'll put my money behind something that not only has a social cause, but actually can give me some sort of return uh, on in, in this investment. Okay, so I, th I, th I think the answer is that there is quite a lot of capital out there. There are a lot of high net worth individuals that are happy to put some money into it. A lot of them will do it behind the scenes. I think um, Citadel do an annual report. It's, it's there, but the opportunity to actually get it to a pro you know, then it becomes, is it actually investment or is it charity? Mm. Again, we come back to this issue of how, what are we investing in? And then we say to them, well, we know that there are a lot of the high net worth individuals that want to get involved in venture capitalism, for instance. But the question is, can they find businesses like this mm. that are sustainable, that'll actually be able to, that have got a bit of a track record and have actually managed through an incredible economic crisis, still are standing at the end of it and saying, well, how do we manage to grow? Can I actually invest in a project that's going to I deliver I do think return? there's still some skepticism around the whole concept, though, and when, a, when entrepreneurs come to businesses, I'm, I've just touched upon in the story, and they're saying there is a social element to it. I think people um, you know, in, in traditional financial institutions are still a bit wary and they, so they see it as a bit airy-fairy. So at the moment, I think that technology entrepreneurs and in those more fast-growing industries are getting more of the capital at the moment. So I think it needs to become more of a mainstream concept in this country as it has already become in, say, the U.S. Justin, would you uh, concur with those sentiments? Uh, have you, you know, ventured out in trying to expand the business and you have, have you found that because you've got social good at the very epicenter of your business that uh, you're not getting as much traction uh, from traditional institutions or are you having to tell the story slightly differently depending uh, on whom you're talking to? Well, th it's, I haven't really um, uh, explored the avenue of, of getting funding for, for my company um, all that much, but I can say that um, it's still very much uh, the, the norm in the, in the corporate industry um, from which I um, uh, receive the equipment to refurbish um, that they would rather donate the equipment straight to a non-profit than, than look at um, doing refurbishment through just species and then it gets donated to, uh, to a non-profit organization. So it's still, they, they don't, they don't mm. really see just species as a social, mm. a social company yet because not a lot of people, um, uh, because as you said, um, it's, it's still very early um, times for social, mm. for social companies and um, it, it's not caught on everywhere. And I think yet. it's still very difficult for social entrepreneurs in this country to go to financial institutions with a, a properly formed business plan because I don't think there's enough business acumen among young young entrepreneurs out there just yet so I think that's probably also playing playing a big role in it. Yeah, and I think the issue is actually topical at the moment. Now you go and look at all the inequality in South Africa at the moment. Mm -hmm. There is just these massive pockets of capital that are very incredibly deep. And then you've got uh, uh, such a lot, you know, there's, there's an interesting stat, and I, you know, I quote quite often on the, on the show, is that if you earn more than 30,000 Rand, you are considered a high, per month, you're considered a high net worth individual in South Africa. If you earn more than three, I think it's three and a half thousand Rand, you're actually considered a high net, a, a, a middle income earner in South Africa. I mean, three and a half thousand Rand is nothing. Not much, we have yeah. this such a big gap between the haves and the have-nots that social entrepreneurship should be something that we're getting right. The, what we have in South Africa though is we have a situation where we have no coordination. We have great little businesses here. We have, the, uh, we have a lot of goodwill and we have a lot of p capital that's sitting there. We cannot seem to coordinate mm -hmm. the efforts and that's why I come back to the issue around SASX Greater Good. These initiatives are there but they just are not getting to the people that want it.